Welcome to another episode of Joan Deserves a Musical, where I talk about my efforts to turn the life of Joan of Arc into an animated musical, and things are getting real, my friends. Whew. This is the last episode I will share with you before I'm on the other side of whatever is about to happen. Uh, so right now, as I'm recording this, Amanda, my songwriter, is in the studio with a technician and with other singers, and then they're recording demos of the songs that is coming together. We are on track to have that all ready for Tuesday, September 3rd. And I now have locked in an appointment with a specific time where I'm going to meet this executive producer at his studio. And we are going to spend an hour together. And I think it's mostly up to me what we spend that hour doing. So a little nervous about that. But it's preparation. Um, I shared with you uh, last week um, a pitch. I got lots of good feedback on that. I made some changes. I don't anticipate being able to pull out that deck and share it with him, but maybe it's ready to go just in case. Um, what I want to do today is share some responses to concerns I have received as uh, uh, concerns that have been shared with me as I've been working on this project. So initially, more than a year ago, uh, when I first reached out and got in contact with this executive producer, he shared a few concerns and that really guided me in early drafts. Uh, he then encouraged me to go get feedback from other people, not just him. I have done that. I've gotten feedback from a lot of people. And so what I have here is just a collection of concerns that have come up. Uh, and I just want to respond to all of them. I'm going to pretend you, my webcam, are uh, the ex executive producer guy. And these are the hard questions he's going to ask me when I meet with him on Tuesday. And I'm going to try to have responses ready to go. So let me know if you think any of this is not compelling or if it's off track. And, uh, and I, I will deeply value your coaching and feedback on that front. Um, some of these I've talked about previously, but I'm just going to hit all of them. One thing, what, when, when I very first met with him, he, he said he liked the sample script I had sent him. He really liked the concept of turning Joan of Arc into an animated musical, but he said there were two catastrophic difficulties. That's the word he used, catastrophic, that we would have to find a way to overcome. Um, and I, I, last we talked, I had not satisfactorily responded to these. Uh, the first is, he said, uh, this is a story of good versus evil, probably. But if that's the case, we have France as the good guys, England as the bad guys. That means England is evil. And that could be a marketing problem if we're going to you know, market this internationally, which is his hope and intention. Um, that, first of all, I'm not going to say this to him. I don't think this is a super valid concern. I would love to hear from any of my English friends out there, if you happen to be watching. Um, I think, uh, you know, England has probably come to terms with the fact that, you know, it was an empire that ruled large swaths of the world for a long time, and it's, it's lost a lot of those. Like, my own country broke away at one point, right? I don't think anybody's angry at England because of this history imperialism and stuff of it like uh but there it is right that's what the history is and if anyone in england is like what we once invaded france i just don't know but let's i'm gonna I, I it's not i don't get if someone shares a concern with me i don't just get to tell them it's not a valid concern and they should stop worrying right that's a jerk move um so my answer to this is we, I have leaned in heavily into historical names and terms. All of the, all of the, the characters get their original French names. The, the place names all have their original French names. And as I was building the script in this way, I discovered that in uh, epistles and, uh, you know, what, whatever, messages sent back and forth between Joan and the other le French leaders of the time, they never referred to the English as the English. They referred to them as the Godins. And this word is mysterious. Nobody exactly knows where it comes from. Nobody knows exactly how long it was in use. We don't know if this is a code word or if it's a slur. Uh, it's, it's, it's just this little artifact of history. And so that is what I've adopted. I talk about France. I talk about the Godins. I never show a map. I never talk about England. None of that is ever really apparent. Of course, anyone who's familiar with the story will know this is a story of France versus England. But anyone who's not, uh, we'll just be watching and they'll say, see, you know, there's this, this girl, Jeanne, and at some point in medieval time, she's leading French armies against this invading power called the Godins. And I think that's fine. I don't think it, I, I, I hope that's good enough. Um, his other catastrophic difficulty, he said, was that this is too dark. 
We've got a story about war, and in the end, the girl gets burned at the stake. We can't make a children's movie out of this. And I'm going to say, um, you know, uh, it is a pretty dark story. You know, someone getting burned at the stake is never something we really want to put in an animated family-friendly musical. But that is outside of the scope of this story. Um, I am telling the heroic journey of Joan leading the armies, getting the king crowned, and it's victory, and it's, it's high adventure, but there's nothing, the, the peril never gets so great, and certainly the, the battle never gets so gruesome that there's anything in there I would be concerned with showing to my own five-year-old who is very sensitive to such things. As an additional layer of protection, I have added this, this sort of conceit where the story is being told by saints to unborn babies. And similar to uh, The Princess Bride, where you have the interplay between the, the grandfather and the grandchild, that's going on here. We get lighthearted commentary. Anytime things get either too extreme or, on the other hand, too boring um, for kids, we cut back, we, we can have the saints and the, and the unborn babies talking about this. Unborn babies are always kind of asking off-topic questions and misunderstanding things, lightens the mood, and then we get back into the story after the not-so-pleasant part is over. I think this is a very tidy, it's an honest way to tell the story. We're not, we're not sanitizing anything, but we are being sensitive to the fact that kids don't, or parents don't want to take their kids to see people bleeding and dying on the battlefield. And so I think I've struck that balance and I'm really excited for you to read it and let me know if you think I have also. Uh, one big question he has asked me over and over is, what is the theme? What is this story about? I don't understand why this is a story worth telling. And if there's anything I've talked about in this video and podcast series more than anything else, it's probably theme. Uh, but where I've landed is, this is a story about belief and trust. Uh, we have lots of stories out in the market where the moral is believe in yourself. Uh, that is that is a, a, an aphorism uh, that has sort of uh, worn out. Uh, in fact, believing in yourself is not always the right thing to do, and it is often insufficient. Joan was a person who believed very strongly in a potential future state of the world and in her ability to move the world toward that future state. She rallied people around her. She persuaded them. She got them to join her side, and she was able to bring about that state of affairs by working and trusting and relying on others. And that's really the way good people change the world in good ways. Because of, we're talking about this lens of belief, it gives us the ability to explore a lot of questions around the concept of trust. Uh, who should you trust? Who can't you trust? What do you do if you trust someone you shouldn't have trusted? What do you do if you didn't trust someone you should have trusted? How can you convince people to trust you? Uh, there are so many different ways to approach the concept of trust. And there are so many different relationships and angles that the Joan of Arc story naturally explores these questions. And I think it's, it makes for an interesting story um, with lots of thematic elements and lots of layers. Uh, you, you can watch it and just enjoy the fun uh, spectacle of it, or you, or you can sit and, and ponder on some of the hard questions that it doesn't shy away from. Um, and I think, I think it's great for that. Both kids and parents will be able to take something away from this movie. So. Those are the questions I have from the executive producer himself. I have here also some notes from various people who have read the script. Now, I wanna call out the fact that the most helpful reviewer in all of this has been my wife, Katie. Uh, she not only read the script and took notes on it, but then while we were on a road trip for several hours, talked to me through her notes and we went back and forth and I suggest ideas and she suggested concerns. And, and that is really why the, the script is in the state it is in today. But because so much of that happened, just in conversation on a road trip, I don't have good notes to be able to review for that. Who I do have good notes from are a couple of college friends of mine and my older brother who read and left me notes. Um, and it's interesting to look back through this. Uh, most of these are from last summer and uh, the script has changed so much, most of them are irrelevant. But there are a couple of things I wanna talk about. Uh, my friend Allie had a serious issue with one scene uh, Joan is entering the garrison with the first military leader she's ever going to talk to. She needs to convince him to send her to King Charles. Um, and as she's trying to find him and act, walking up to him, she just has this little monologue where she's talking to herself. Like, what am I going to say? I, should I say, like, God has sent me to you? No, that sounds crazy. Maybe I should just say, I have news about Orleans. No, then he'll ask me how I have news. And in the course of this, I had her say, I know. I'll, maybe I'll just say, dude, Robbie, sup, brah. And Allie was like, that totally broke the moment for me. Um, that whole monologue 
is now gone because I've come across this concept of adorkable heroines. Uh, you can you can uh, go to YouTube and search for Disney's adorkable princesses. There are a few videos about this, and it kind of seems like since Tangled, uh, we and we've had a, a recurring protagonist trope with Disney, which is just these silly, lighthearted, uh, naive kind of princesses, right? I feel like the best example of this is Anna from Frozen. And I feel like it works really well for her because she is counterpoint to Elsa who takes everything seriously, right? And so we have these two moving through the world in very different ways and butting up against each other. And that's delightful. But then fast forward to Wish and Asha, is that the protagonist's name? Is basically Anna, but there is no Elsa. She's just silly and goofy all the time, and it's it's off-putting. And I realized um, I fell into that trap. And so I have revised Joan since Ali read this. I've taken away all of that. Uh, Joan is naive, but she is also determined and gung-ho. She sees her goals. She's after them no matter what. And uh, there's none of this hand-wringing, talking to myself, saying silly things. Oh, that was like a crazy trust exercise, right? Like all of that is gone. Um Ali also said there were too many saints. Initial drafts of this had a whole host, a close to 10, I think, different saints arguing with each other about what to do. There were lots of funny moments in that, but it took up a ton of space, and it was just really hard to keep them straight. When you're reading the, the, the script, you can see who's speaking. Oh, so-and-so, patron saint of whatever thing. But if you were just seeing these faces on the screen, you would have no idea who any of them were, what their motivations were, why they were talking the way they were. And it just, it was like half the screenplay. So now there are only two saints. Uh, that's much simpler. And I think it accomplishes its goal. Uh, one very good question Ali asked is, who is the target audience for this as far as age of kids? Um, and so I've done a little research. It's interesting to note that Pixar and Disney have slightly different targets um, in terms of uh, ideal age range. Um, Disney starts much younger, 2 to 11, I think is the range they give. Um, Pixar targets a little older and includes teenagers and young adults, right? And of course, uh, those of us who are in those categories know we go see Pixar movies even if kids aren't involved. Um, for me, I think uh, it's probably closer to the Disney range. Um, I, I can imagine two and three-year-olds enjoying like the music and the, the color and the spectacle of it. There's nothing in it, as I said, that's so intense that would make parents uncomfortable with the kids having it. Um, but I will admit, I am often puzzled. I don't know why my kids uh, age 5, 8, and 10 like Soul, for instance, or Inside Out. I feel like these are heavy philosophical movies with very little levity to lighten them up. And yet my kids are just mesmerized by them and love them. Um, and that's always been interesting to me. I think this movie will have a lot of elements where parents and young adults and teenagers will be like, oh, I understand what's going on. I have no idea why my nephew or little brother or son or whoever is really into this right now because it's pretty serious stuff, but hey, he seems to like it. Um, I'm hoping that's how it can go. Also, I'm saying he, but in traditional princess movie fashion, the protagonist is female. And so there is a chance that this will appear more to girls than to boys, but I, I intend for everyone to like it. Um, then my friend Carl, I'm going long, I apologize, uh, asked a lot of really insightful questions. He, he found Joan not very likable. I feel like my revision of her making her less adorkable um, was really helpful. He also asked about her motivation. The draft he read, I had so many instances where someone would say, why are you doing this? And she'd be like, it's my calling. It's my calling. This is my calling. It's my calling. And uh, for Carl, that really fell flat. And once he pointed it out, I was like, yeah, this isn't that interesting. And so I've added a lot more depth. I have Joan sometimes struggling to articulate her motivations, trying to express what she actually wants. But the underlying thing is she just wants this war to end. She wants peace. She believes the status quo is unacceptable, that we can't just keep letting this invading army treat us this way. We need to retake France and be our own nation. And she does feel called to be the one to do this. But even before that moment, she just has this sense of somebody should change this. Uh, and then it turns out she's the one to change it. Uh, he, uh, Carl also asked me a lot about the tone. And the two uh, examples, uh, movies he, he used as kind of a spectrum for me to put it on are The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which is a very serious uh, animated film, uh, versus Hercules, which is all very lighthearted and silly. Uh, they both have, you know, religious elements in them. And I have referenced both of these as I've tried to describe this movie to you over the course of these now almost 30 episodes. Um, but he wanted to know where would I put it? Um, I think 
in my heart, I would love to be closer to Hercules. I would love to just make this lighthearted fun. Um, but I think we are closer to the the hunchback side of things. Now, hunchback goes very dark, very scary. The song Hellfire is terrifying. And, and they're like, you know, molten iron or, or something being poured on, poured on soldiers. Uh, there's some scary stuff in there. Uh, nothing in this movie that I'm making is anywhere near that scary. Uh, but it's also not as silly as Pain and Panic uh, wearing Hercules-themed uh, flip-flops, right? Like, I, I'm not going there either. Somewhere in the middle, but probably more on the serious side. Um, and then the last bit of feedback he had, which is also no longer relevant, my original prologue was a map. Here's a map of France. Here's where England is invading. Uh, that is that is history. That is long gone. We're using this uh, this narrative structure of the saints telling the story to the unborn children instead. And I think it's much better, much more engaging for kids uh, and, and just a lot more fun in a lot of ways. So those are my answers to concerns that have been given to me. It is possible that on Tuesday, uh, my, my executive producer friend will come up with some entirely new concerns that I've never heard before. And I hope that just by virtue of having talked at you for so many hours about this movie, um, I will have answers to some of those. Uh, or at least come off as a the confident sort of chap who can find answers to them. So that's my last video before something else happens. And next week, I will give you a full report of what happened or maybe what didn't happen, or maybe I'll still be waiting for word on whether what I hoped happened did or not. Um, but thanks for sticking with me through all of this. Uh, because of you, I feel much more prepared for this meeting than I otherwise would but I'm still sweating buckets and I'll let you know how it went when it's over.